Well, while we're all gathered here, let me pray for us. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for the resurrection power of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we, th and that we thank you, God, that through his resurrection, we experience abundant blessing and gifts. Today, O oh God, as we explore one facet of the resurrection, one of these gifts, one of these blessings, we ask that you would draw us closer to you. You would open up our minds so we can understand, open up our hearts so we can appreciate and worship and thank you, and also open up our lives so we can live like this gift is true in us. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So this week, our, uh, the theme is from emptiness to fulfillment, from emptiness to fulfillment. And hopefully you all got a handout, okay? Hopefully you all got a handout. Our theme is from emptiness to fulfillment. And the, uh, I have a question to ask you to get us thinking about this is, have you experienced a moment or a season of emptiness in your life? And what did that feel like? It would not have been a pleasant experience by any means. It would have been a, a, a grief, grief-filled, sorrow-filled, perhaps anxiety-driven experience in our lives. But one of the things that the resurrection promises us is that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord, through our risen Lord, He has promised to take us from emptiness to fulfillment. From emptiness to fulfillment. And we see this in one of the stories I think we see this in the most is the story of Mary Magdalene who visits the empty tomb of Jesus in John's gospel. Okay, so we're going to take a look at that story, but I want to unpack a few things for us. The first thing I want to do is I want to demarcate, I want to distinguish between two kinds of emptiness that we can experience. The first one is an emptying of the soul caused by circumstances outside of our control. So this could be things like we get a diagnosis that we weren't expecting, and it causes grief and sorrow in us. All our hope flees away. Or it could be that we found out that our marriage is falling apart and we weren't expecting that. So this is an emptying of the soul caused by circumstances outside of our control. But the second one is an emptying of the soul that we need to do. Maybe there's something in there that shouldn't be in there. Pride comes to mind, for example. Or greed, another one that comes to mind. That shouldn't be in there. But that's an emptying of the soul that we need to do. And what we're going to do today is we're going to actually talk about and look at both of these kinds of emptiness of the soul. One that's caused by circumstances outside of our control and one that is something that is totally within our control that we need to do. Okay? And so to get us thinking about this, we're going to look at John chapter 20, verses 1, and then we're going to skip a little bit and then look at verses 11 to 20. So you have this in your handout here. Let me read it for us. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled, uh, the stone had been removed from the tomb. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And what happened in these 10 verses is that uh, she went and told some of the disciples. They came and saw the tomb was empty. They went away as well. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to, him, she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And so this, this entire story will help us, and in a few minutes you'll, you'll notice this, this entire story helps us understand what it looks like for Jesus to take us from emptiness to fulfillment. And the first one we're going to look at is an emptying of the soul caused by circumstances outside of our control. We're going to take a look at that kind of emptiness first. And where a story begins is it begins with Mary standing outside uh, the tomb and she's weeping. And as she weeps, she bends over to look inside the tomb. Now, I have an artistic rendition here, which has some aspects accurate to the story, but other aspects that are not. But nonetheless, it is helpful for us to see what's going on. What we see here is Mary Magdalene. She obviously looks like a young woman with very long, flowing hair. Okay? She's now bent over the tomb, and she's just weeping and crying. She doesn't look happy. Now, I want you to file away this detail of her long flowing hair because we'll need it later on. So here's Mary Magdalene. She's at the tomb. She's wondering what's going on. And the, we, we hear about the angels, etc., coming there. And then what ends up happening is that we also know that Jesus comes there. And she sees Jesus standing there. And she thinks that Jesus is the gardener. Now, that's another interesting detail, okay? Because Jesus could have been the watchman, but she doesn't think that he's the watchman. Jesus could have been, as, uh, Jesus could have been another walker by coming to pay his respects at some other tomb in the area, but she doesn't think that. She thinks, and she's convinced, that he's the gardener. Now, what's interesting in John's gospel is that every word that John uses in his gospel, he's trying to show us some significance. If John says, for example, charcoal fire, there's a significance to that. If John, for example, tells us some Greeks came to see Jesus, there's some significance to that. If John says, and Jesus took the robe and wrapped it around his waist, there's some significance to that. Similarly, when John says she thought he was the gardener, there's some significance to that. And here you can look at a picture, a painting here from Rembrandt, 1638. And you can see Jesus as a gardener. Okay? So he has a gardening hat on. And what do you see in his hand? A shovel. What do you see in his waist? Can you guys see that? Can't see it? Okay, let me try to zoom in. Can you all see that in his waist? Yeah, it looks like a knife, right? It would have been a common gardening tool made to cut off the weeds and things like that. Let me show you something else. So we see the angels by the tomb. Okay. And we see beside Mary... Something right here. Okay? Do you all want to take a guess about what that is? Spices. Okay, now I want you once again. So now we have two details, or three details that we're filing away. And we'll slowly resolve this. Long hair, file away. Gardener, file that away. Little jar of spices, file that away. Okay? I want to show you something else that's a little interesting. This isn't... Um, pertinent to our to, to today's lesson, but uh, can you see these gentlemen right over here? Walking away. You all see that? So it, it's the back of one's hat. Another one has some kind of covered hair. Okay? So um, if the contrast was better, we could see it. But essentially what it is is that it's the two disciples walking away after they visit the empty tomb. So lots of details in here. But the one that I want us to look at and, and pay attention to is Jesus has a hat, Jesus has a shovel, Jesus has a gardening tool tucked away in his belt, Mary has this little vase over here. Okay? Now I want us to look at, uh, I want us to ask the question, well, why, why is 
Why does John make this detail apparent to us that Jesus was a gardener, or at least Mary thought that Jesus was a gardener? Well, I want to show us something else. I want to show us this next painting. Now, in this one, we see Jesus, of course, over here, right? And we see Mary over here, okay? So we see Jesus and Mary. Now, I want to show something else. I want you to look at the contrast in colors between the tomb and the field. Between the tomb and the field. What are some things that you see in the contrast of colors, texture, details, etc.? Yes, light and dark. The tomb is, it's like cold rock, right? If you, can you imagine touching that? How many of you have a marble countertop at home or a stone? Does it ever feel warm? Does it ever feel like that's something you'd want to embrace? No, right? So if you touch that thing, that tomb, it would have been cold, kind of damp maybe. Not, very, not a very friendly kind of space. Meanwhile, the garden, on the other hand, would have been soft, verdant, lush, green, abundant. And so what we're seeing over here is that this artist is trying to show us that somehow Jesus has walked out of the place of emptiness and he's created a place of lush life. Okay? Jesus has walked out of this place of cold, dark emptiness and he's created lush life. See, a lot of us, the emptiness that we experience in your life is unfriendly. It's cold. It's not warm there. Death is a kind of emptiness. Death is the ultimate form of emptiness. And what we find out in this little story of John's gospel is that Jesus is the gardener who, through his resurrection power, is able to bring out the most abundant life out of death. Jesus doesn't take death and somehow look like, I can't do anything with this. He looks at death and says, I will change this. I will bring life out of this. The resurrection comes after and out of the death of Jesus Christ. And similarly, no matter what kind of emptiness that you and I are experiencing in our lives, Jesus can take that emptiness and it can bring life out of it. So I want you to think about, for example, the last time that you experienced emptiness. What was it? You don't have to tell me, but just close your eyes and think about the last time you experienced emptiness. Maybe it was some diagnosis. Maybe it was a, a conflict with your significant other. Maybe it was work-related. And I want you to imagine... Jesus with his shovel bringing out life out of that circumstance. He's there digging up the dirt and out of that dirt comes abundant life. We see this more pronouncedly in this next piece of art. And you can see, for example, Jesus definitely does have a shovel in his hand. And you can see all kinds of fruits and vegetables, life, greenery, flowers even, right? You can see flowers over here. You can see all kinds of wonderful things that Jesus brings out of his death. And similarly, he'll also do this out of our deaths. If we are experiencing any kind of emptiness caused by circumstances outside of our control, the risen Jesus, he is the gardener who brings abundant life out of emptiness. Now, here's another one, though. There's not just the emptiness that is caused to us by circumstances outside of our control. 
There's also an emptiness of the soul that we need to do. There's also an emptying of the soul that we need to do. So remember I told you about the detail about uh, Mary Magdalene's long hair? Remember that? Okay. So file it, so keep that in the back of your mind. And now remember this painting that I showed you where we talked about this little jar here? Okay, you have the text of John's gospel with you, right? Does it say that Mary took a jar with her? Yes or no? No. But the Jesus being the gardener only comes up in John's gospel. It doesn't come up in any of the other gospels. Mary and the other woman carrying jars of spice comes up in the other gospels, never in John's gospel. Okay? But in, in all of the paintings, they will always show, so not just this one. Okay? So look at this one too over here. Once again, Mary has a jar right over here. Well, what's going on? Why do all of these different artists show us this little jar that John never mentions at all? Well, if you go back in John's gospel and read about Mary, you find out that John makes a big note about the jar of nard that Mary brings. And he talks about how Judas looks at Mary breaking open this jar it's cost 300 denarii. One denarius was one day's wages. 300 denarii would have been 300 days' wages. A lot of money. Mary takes that jar. She cracks it open. She anoints Jesus' feet. And with her tears, you can see in this artist, he really wanted to highlight the tears and look like pearls. Her tears drip on Jesus' feet. And with her hair, she wipes Jesus' feet. Okay? So let's put it all together. Okay? So you have Mary. Now, Mary, as we all know, what was her occupation? Maybe we don't say that word in church, right? Okay? Yeah, but she was a prostitute. The Bible says it. Okay? Mary was a prostitute. Back then, if you were a prostitute, your hair was very much part of your trade. Okay? Chaste women covered their hair. So when we see all the paintings of other women in the New Testament, Jesus' mother, Mary, for example, the hair is always covered. And this is true even today, for example, in many parts of the Middle East and North Africa where women cover their hair. Right? They wear hijabs or burqas or whatever, and they cover their hair. Unchaste women do not cover their hair. Unchaste women do not cover their hair. And especially if you were a prostitute, you wouldn't cover your hair because this is how you attract good clients. This is what you would use to earn your wages. So think about how many men that she would have slept with to earn 300 denarii. And then think about what she's doing in this picture. She is taking the tools of her trade and she is sacrificing them at the feet of Jesus. And she is washing his feet with her hair. And she is crying, right? She's in tears. This could be tears of repentance, it could be tears of joy. Whatever it is, there's some emptying out happening there. She's emptying out herself at the feet of Jesus. And when she empties out herself, she experiences what I would say, the forgiveness of her sins. She experiences new life. She experiences the resurrection. Which is why in this picture, once again, in this painting, we see, for example, that Mary has that jar there. 
And you can see that this time, Jesus' feet are pierced, right? In the previous picture, there's no holes in his feet, right? It's before his crucifixion. There's no holes in his hand. There's no holes in his feet. But in this picture, you can see the hole in his side. You can see the hole in his hands. And you can also see the holes in his feet. And this jar is still there. Okay? And what we basically are left here to think about is that Mary Magdalene, in this case, because a few days earlier, she had emptied out all of those things in her life that she regretted, now she is able to experience the risen Lord. Do you know in John's gospel, who is the first person who meets the risen Jesus? Mary Magdalene. Wasn't Peter? Wasn't John who wrote the gospel? Right? It wasn't any of the other disciples. It was Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, throughout the history of the church, has been called the apostle to the apostles. Think about that. She is the one that Jesus sends the apostle, to the other apostles, James, Peter, etc., to tell them, guess what, guys? I met the risen Jesus, and he truly is alive. And remember back then, she was a prostitute, right? That's all people have remembered about her. Back then, women, their witness in court was considered unworthy and unreliable. You needed three women to count as one man to make, to, to, to make a claim in court. Okay. How many of the women here would like that? None of us, right? It was an incredibly unequal society in terms of the authority and the responsibility given to women. What does Jesus do, though? He elevates her. And he gives her this message and trusts her and tells her, go and tell my brothers. You go tell my brothers that I truly am risen. I'm alive again. She's called the apostle to the apostles. But all this only happens, why? Because she emptied out her soul. She emptied out her soul and God then blessed her with this very important responsibility and gave her the gift of this resurrection, the fulfillment of being in His presence and being the first witness, the first witness, the first fruit of His resurrection power. You know, in our own lives as well, there's many things that we need to empty our souls from. We need to empty our souls from things like greed. We need to empty our souls from things like pride. We need to empty our souls from things like arrogance. But the list is longer than that. And I've identified three things for us that we need to empty from our soul, okay? Because when we empty our soul, only then can we make room for the risen Jesus. It's only when we empty our souls can we make room for the risen. If our souls are filled with all these other things that I'm going to get into, there is no room for Jesus. There is no room for his resurrection power to make a difference in our lives. It's only when our souls are emptied can he actually come and abide in us and with us and give us his resurrection power. So there's three things that I want to identify for us that we need to empty our soul from. The crutches from past trauma, the fear of new beginnings, and the pride of self-abundance. The crutches from past trauma, the fear of new beginnings, and the pride of self-abundance. And if we can empty our souls of these things, then we can experience the fullness of the risen Jesus. What do I mean, the crutches from past trauma? It's quite possible that for many of us here, either when we were kids, based on our family dynamic, or maybe from a past relationship or something like that, we were traumatized. Okay? And to cope with that trauma, we picked up a habit that made sense in that season of life. And we still hold on to it. A good example, sometimes, some children, when they experience trauma in their life, in, in, in their family life or whatever, they pick up a coping mechanism 
maybe as they get older, maybe it's substance abuse. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's unhealthy relationships. They pick up a coping mechanism to carry them through that season. But once that season is also way behind us in the past, we still will carry the crutches of that trauma. We'll still carry that. It could be any number of things. It could be something in our lives like an addiction to something. It could be, for example, our responses to certain triggers. All these different things are actually crutches that helped us when we had past trauma. Right? What do we use crutches for when we break a leg? Once our legs are good, do we still need the crutches? Do we? No, we don't need the crutches anymore, right? But sometimes in our life, in our emotional lives, in our psychological lives, we will still carry some crutches with us that we don't need anymore. And what God wants us to do is that he wants us to put down those crutches. He wants us to experience his healing. There's a really good story like this in the New Testament where uh, there is a, a, it comes up in Mark's gospel where there's a blind man who wants to be healed by Jesus. Okay? Now back then, once again, if you were blind, you were homeless. If you were homeless, you didn't really have much going on for you. And if you were begging for money, you tended to wear poor man's clothes. And so this guy had a poor man's robe. He was blind and had a poor man's robe. Okay, so he's calling out to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. He keeps yelling it out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. The disciples start getting annoyed and they start saying to Jesus, Jesus, can you make this guy shut up? He's scaring away all the nice people. Okay? And so Jesus says, I, don't, I wonder how Jesus actually felt when his disciples said that. But what Jesus does is that he says, well, no, bring him to me instead. And this is what it says. So the disciples go and tell him, hey, hey, you. Jesus wants to meet with you. Okay? You know what Mark says in his gospel? He says, the blind man stood up and took off his coat. Why did he do that? He knew he was going to be healed. And that coat was like a crutch. And he knew he did not need it anymore. In the same way, we carry crutches in our life. And if we really want to experience the fullness of Jesus Christ, we got to empty our lives, our hearts, our souls out of those crutches. Put it down. Get rid of it. Jesus cannot fill you up if you're still walking around on crutches. If you're walking around on crutches, you're saying you don't know if Jesus can heal you or not. Put it down. Jesus can heal you. That's the first one, is the crutches from uh, past trauma. But the second one is this, the fear of new beginnings. The fear of new beginnings. When I was in uh, a youth and student ministry many years ago, I went on this uh, little um, uh, youth retreat. Okay, we went to a Christian camp. It was like two nights, three days, Christian camp. It was great, tons of fun. But they had this trust exercise, and this is what the trust exercise is. They, they, they strap you on to a safety harness. You climb up this pole, very narrow pole. It's kind of like an electrical pole, right? Doesn't look very safe, but it's pretty sturdy. But you, but you don't know or think that or believe that it's sturdy. So you climb up on the very top, okay? It's probably taller than, this, than the ceiling, by the way. You climb at the very top. At the top, the, the top of this is about like eight inches. Eight inches that's about as wide it is, as it is. You have to stand on top of it and jump off to this bar and catch the bar. Okay? You have to jump off and catch the bar. Now, here's the thing. Everyone who gets up there, their fear and their anxiety reaches to a certain point of where they're thinking to themselves, I want to hold my safety harness. I, I'm, if I hold my safety harness, I'll be safe. The problem is, if you hold your safety harness, you cannot jump and catch that pole, the, 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 the bar. 
But that's the exercise. You gotta jump and catch that bar. Now there's about 35 of us. Do you know how many of us failed? Zero. Do you know why? Because in that moment, we all had to realize, do I fear the future so much that I don't want to jump towards it? Standing on this eight, eight inches pole is not safe. I don't have a lot of time here. Oh no, there's a breeze. I need to jump. The bar looks further than it actually is, by the way, because when you're up there and you're scared, you can't actually discern distances. But it turns out the bar is about as far as this thing is from me, okay? And if you jump, anyway, everyone makes it, okay? My point here is this. Sometimes we can fear new beginnings. We're so comfortable in the past. And the past sometimes is not always healthy, but we're more comfortable with something that is unhealthy because we don't know what to expect in the future. And we're so comfortable in the past, and we don't want to let go of the past. But if we want the risen Jesus to fill us up, we have to be willing to let go of that fear of new beginnings. We have to be able to learn to embrace new beginnings. See, the resurrection is a new beginning, isn't it? It's a new beginning. How can we embrace the resurrection if we're afraid of it? We can't. We have to let go of this fear, whatever that fear is. We have to embrace new beginnings. So that's another thing that we need to empty our soul from. And finally, another thing that we need to empty our soul from is the pride of self-abundance. The pride of self-abundance. Um, when I used to do college ministry, college students tend to be sometimes either the most faithful students to, the, to Christ or sometimes they think they know it all, right? And so I remember having multiple conversations with multiple dudes about how come you guys don't show up to church or to Bible study? And this is what I would hear. I would tell them, well, I don't, I don't really need Jesus right now, right? And I'd ask, well, when do, you, when do you think you'll need Jesus? Maybe if I failed an exam, right? And then I try to extrapolate that for them. I'm like, okay, well, it sounds like what you're saying is that in life, you probably will only need Jesus if things get difficult, right? For example, if you're going through a messy marriage or, you know, your job hunt has been failing you, whatever. And then I try to probe and ask them this question, ask them, what makes you think that you're actually going to reach out to Jesus in that time? If you're not reaching out to him right now, what's going to make you reach out to him then? Why would you not just go around doing something else? Because what I'm trying to help them understand is this. There's something in all of us. I mean, because of the fall, because of Adam and Eve's first sin, there is in us a kind of sliver in our hearts of self-abundance. We all actually crave self-abundance. We all want to be our own God. We all only want Jesus when it is convenient for us. The rest of the time, we want to do what we want to do when we want to do it. That's the pride of self-abundance. It says basically, I don't actually need God. He's like a Coke that makes a meal better. But I'm on a diet right now and I don't really need a Coke. Okay, So when we say something like that, we're actually revealing the pride of self-abundance. And God will never meet us there. You know, If we say we have no need of God, he's going to respect that. And he's going to say, all right, figure it out. Sometimes I do that to my kids and it goes horribly. Right? Fine, you figure it out. Next thing I know, something's broken. Right? But it's, it's a way of, it, it, but God does the same thing with us. He, he's created us with enough freedom, enough common sense for us to, when, we, uh, when our choices go awry, we should be able to look at it and say, ah, I messed up. I shouldn't have been relying upon myself. I should go back to Jesus. However, not all of us end up doing that. We actually go back and say, well, I shouldn't have done it myself in that way. I'm going to do it myself in a different way. 
And what God actually wants us to do, He wants us to disabuse ourselves of that false notion. He created us to be in relationship with Him, to be dependent upon Him. And when we exhibit this kind of self-abundance, it really is a form of pride. And until we empty ourselves of the spirit, the sliver of self-abundance, we cannot experience the fullness of the resurrection. We cannot experience the fullness of the resurrection. And so this is what I want to leave you with. There's three things that we need to empty our soul from. The crutches from past trauma, the fear of new beginnings, the pride of self-abundance. The crutches of past trauma, the fear of new beginnings, the pride of self-abundance. And when we empty our souls of these three things, we will experience the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We will experience His resurrection power working in us. We will move from emptiness to what I said, fulfillment. The risen Jesus wants to take us from emptiness to fulfillment. He is the gardener who brings out abundant life from death. The risen Jesus wants to take us from emptiness to fulfillment. He is the gardener who brings out abundant life from death. I want to close with a wonderful poem by uh, an American poet from the 19th century called Henry Abbey. It's called Mary Magdalene. It actually recounts to us this gospel passage from John chapter 20. He says, It's written from the the perspective of Mary Magdalene. She says, All night I cried in agony of grief and bitter loss and wept for him whom they had nailed against the shameful cross. But in the morning, in the dark, before the east was gray, I hastened to the sepulcher wherein the body lay. The stone was rolled away, I found, And filled with fear and woe, I straight to his disciples ran there off to let them know. I said, the body of the Lord is not within the tomb, for they have taken him away unnoticed in the gloom. Where have they laid him? Who can tell? Alas, we know not where. The words were slower than my tears to utter my despair. Then two disciples coming forth with hurried footsteps sped till at the garden sepulchre they found, as I had said. They saw the door stone rolled away, the empty tomb and wide, the linen face cloth folded up and grave clothes laid inside. The morn was cold, I heeded not, with sorrow wrapped about. Till both were gone to tell the rest, I stood and wept without. Then stooping down and looking in, I saw two angels there, whose faces shone with love and joy and were divinely fair. In white effulgence garmented that showed the hewn rock's grain, one at the head, one at the feet, sat where my Lord had lain. To look on them, I was afraid. Their splendor was so great They said to me, Why weepest thou? In tones tones compassionate. I weep, I said, for that my Lord is taken hence away, and that, alas, I do not know where he is laid today. I sadly rose and turning back beheld one standing by and knew the lily of the dawn unfolded in the sky. But in the pale, uncertain light, too blind with tears to see, I thought it was the gardener there at the tomb with me. It soothed me much the day before to see it in my mind that in a garden they had laid the flower of all mankind. Until thy fragrance fell on me, a thrall to sin was I. O flower of peace, O flower of grace, thy love is liberty. But they had taken him away who is of sin the price, 
I held the gift that I had brought of perfume, all and spice. I had not stayed to braid my hair, and in the early breeze, the long black luster, damp with tears, down fluttered to my knees. I dimly saw the gardener. In grief, I bowed my head. Why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? He softly, gently said. O oh, sir, if thou have borne him hence, I eagerly replied, tell me where thou hast laid my Lord, whom they have crucified, and I will take him thence away. O oh, tell me where he lies. Mary, he said, I knew the voice and turned in glad surprise. For he was not the gardener that I advanced to greet. I cried, Rabboni, joyfully, and knelt at Jesus' feet. Let me pray for us. Gracious and Heavenly Father, as we meditate upon the life of this, your daughter Mary Magdalene, the apostle to the apostles, who came while Jesus was eating with his friends and broke open her expensive nard perfume, poured it upon his legs, his feet, washed them with her tears like pearls, wiped them with her hair. She emptied herself, O God, of all her sin. And then she showed up to the tomb expecting it to be filled and you gave her the greatest gift of all, the empty tomb. And Jesus stood there as a gardener, showing her that he brings abundant and lush life out of death. Help us to know, Lord Jesus, in our own hearts and our own souls where there is death. You desire to bring life out of it. Where there is emptiness, you desire to bring fulfillment out of it. Help us to believe, Lord Jesus, that your resurrection power transcends anything that we can experience, any loss that we have experienced in our lives. Help us, Lord Jesus, to know that when we empty out ourselves at your feet, you gladly will fill our hearts with yourself. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your great love towards us and help us to be like your friend, Mary Magdalene. Help us to follow in her footsteps as she knew and experienced you in her life. We ask all this in your name, Lord. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining me today. Next week will be, thank you.